you beloved thank you for tuning in on our local radio station radio easter river may god just richly and abundantly bless you thank you for giving us this opportunity to share the gospel with you and may the grace of god just be with you i greet you in the precious name of our lord jesus christ our savior our maker our creator our lord our king and may his name just be blessed forevermore now beloved we just listened to a beautiful song a well-known christian hymn known as amazing grace and we will talk tonight on this program about the grace of god something that we cannot live without something that we cannot do without and it is the grace of our lord jesus christ so you're tuned in on the program a study in the word with me elma skreiner may god just richly bless you as we close our eyes lord jesus thank you for giving us this opportunity to share the gospel lord many years ago you gave the great commission and you said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believes and is baptized shall be saved but he that does not believe shall be condemned lord you instructed the disciples to go into all nations and to make disciples of all nations lord we are here to perform your word we are here to obey lord and we want to do as they did in the beginning we want to preach only the word and we pray lord that you will just reveal and give an understanding to those that are tuned in that are listening tonight in jesus holy name amen god bless you beloved once again i greet you in the precious name of our lord jesus christ so you're tuned in on the program a study in the word and we shall study tonight the grace of god what the bible has to say about the grace of god and we shall read from the gospel according to saint john saint john chapter 1 from verse 16 out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given for the law was given through moses grace and truth came through jesus christ no one has ever seen god <coughs> but the one and only son who is himself god and is the closest relationship with the father has made him known may god bless the reading of his word the bible makes it plain that grace upon grace we have received through jesus christ it makes it plain that the law came through moses now there is a difference between law and grace and we should have the right understanding when it comes to law and grace now the law could not save anyone the law could only condemn you the law was almost like a police officer that jails you that puts the handcuffs on but he cannot free you but grace is what sets you free grace is the favor of god the unmerited favor grace means god giving us pardon and god giving us salvation grace is something that we don't earn it is something that we don't deserve but it is something that god gives us because of his goodness because of his love because of his kindness god bestows his grace upon us and the bible says that christ is the only begotten of the father the bible says nobody has seen god but the only begotten son which was in the bosom of the father he has declared him christ was the manifestation of god the bible says in hebrews chapter 1 the bible says that christ is the image of the invisible god christ is the representation and the manifestation of the invisible god and christ himself is the manifestation of the grace of god now the bible makes it plain that god is a gracious god he is full of grace and the bible also says that christ is full of grace and he is full of truth now grace as i said is something that we cannot earn it's something that we cannot merit doesn't matter what we do it's not what we do it's what god has already done for us by his grace by his mercy by his favor grace is the unmerited favor of almighty god now the apostle paul gave a very deep teaching about the grace of god he speaks in ephesians chapter 2 from verse 8 to verse 10 he says these words and it's important that we always go back to what the word says this program is called a study in the word so we want to study what the word of god says not the word of a man because man will fail 
The Bible says, let every man be a liar and let God be true. Now Paul writes, as an apostle of God, commissioned by Almighty God, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul makes it very plain that we are saved by grace through faith. And it is not of our own doing, it is not of our own works, but it is a gift of God. It is something that God gives to us freely. Now we don't go to heaven because we are good. We don't go to heaven because of our works. We go to heaven because of the grace of God, the grace that God bestowed upon us. Now, how did God bestow His grace upon us? Firstly, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned. And the Bible even says in Psalm 51 that we were born in sin. We were shapen in iniquity. We came into the world speaking lies. And then the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, hallelujah, once again the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God gave us a gift. We deserve death. We deserve punishment. We deserve hell. Why? Because we have sinned. And our sin has only one punishment, and that punishment is death. When God spoke to Adam, the first man, in Genesis chapter 2, God said, of all the trees in the garden, you may eat freely. But of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, don't eat it, don't touch it. The day you eat thereof, that day you die. That was the word of Almighty God. And what happened? We see that Satan came and he possessed the serpent. And he spoke to the woman and he asked her this question, is it so that God said you shall not eat of all the trees that are in the garden? And the woman said of all the trees in the garden we may eat freely, but of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said we shall not eat thereof, neither shall we touch it, for the day we eat thereof, that day we shall die. And the serpent said, you shall not surely die, but God knows if you eat of that tree, you shall just be like God. Now we see the devil coming the same way even today trying to tell people the opposite of what God had said. But notice, God said the day you eat, day of that day you die. And the day they did eat of that tree, the Bible says that the woman ate and she gave to her husband also, and they did die. Now we're not just talking about natural death, we're talking about spiritual death. Because spiritual death means a separation from God, a separation from the presence of Almighty God. And that is what sin does. Sin separates you from God. The Bible even speaks in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59. The prophet speaks these words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That is what sin does. It separates you from God. It brings about a wall of partition between you and God. And it causes God not to be able to answer your prayers. Why? Because of sin. Sin causes a blockage. Sin causes a wall of partition. A wall of separation between you and God. So that is what sin does. It brings about death. So because our ancestors had sinned, and we have also sinned, there is nothing left for us but judgment and death. But God, by His grace and by His mercy, did something wonderful for us. He bestowed His grace upon us on the cross of Calvary. Now Romans chapter 5, the Bible says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. 
For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So the Bible makes it very plain that sin came into the world through one man and through that sin came death into the world. But also through one man came life and that man is Jesus Christ. He gave us life because he laid down his life. Now we know, beloved, that if people have blood diseases, it's possible for blood to be transfused to save another person's life. And that is what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. He shed his blood for us. He laid down his life so that we can have eternal life. He actually donated his blood as an offering for our sins. He was not forced to do it, but he did it freely, willingly. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Christ shed his precious blood for you and me, and that is how God bestowed his grace upon us. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse 5, the Bible says, For he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Christ took our sins upon himself, and he also took the punishment of our sins upon himself. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 26, that while Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that his, his sweat became like blood drops, as he was already drinking the cup, the cup that was filled with our iniquities, filled with our sin, filled with our unrighteousness. He was drinking that cup. He was taking the sins upon himself in the garden. And then on the cross of Calvary, he was paying the price for the sins that he already took upon himself. He was sinless, but he became a sinner, a sinner like you and me. Not because he had sinned, but because of our sins. Our sins caused him to become a sinner. Our sins caused him to become unrighteous. He took our unrighteousness upon himself so that we could be, can become righteous. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself hallelujah god coming in christ paying the price on the cross of calvary taking away our sins shedding his blood and reconciling us to himself why did god have to reconcile us back to him because of sin sin caused a separation sin caused the fall sin caused god and man to be separated but god came and he reconciled us back to him on the cross of Calvary. And that is how the grace of God was manifested. Jesus Christ was the manifestation and the representation of the grace of God. He showed us what the grace of God was like. He showed us what God himself is like. Now many times people misunderstand the grace of God. People sometimes think that the grace of God is a ticket for them to do whatever they want to do. Because God just keeps on forgiving, God keeps on loving. But people many times misunderstand. And Paul also clarified this misunderstanding already in the beginning. When he wrote to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 6 from verse 15. He says these words. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. 
You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. That is what the grace of God does. It sets you free from sin. The grace of God doesn't put you in, bond, in bondage. The grace of God sets you free from sin, free from bondage. He says, I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul makes it very plain that once you become a partaker of the grace of God, you also become a partaker of righteousness. Somebody that has really experienced the grace of God does not want to do iniquity, but that same person desires to do righteousness. And that person also makes his body available, his soul and his spirit for righteousness. Even the Apostle John was making it very, very plain in his epistle which he wrote to the church that people should not be confused when it comes to righteousness and when it comes to unrighteousness. He says these words in 1 John chapter 3 verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. Don't be misled. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is why... This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother. Now the apostle makes it very plain. He that does righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. And he that does unrighteousness is unrighteous. So just because you have become a partaker of the grace of God, it does not mean that you can love any way you want to or do anything that you want to. But as Paul made it plain, once you become a partaker of the grace of God, you become a slave of righteousness. Now a slave is somebody that does not have any rights. It is somebody that is owned by another person. A slave is somebody that is controlled by another person. And so are the children of God. They are owned by another person and that person is Jesus Christ. They are controlled by Jesus Christ. They answer to their master which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he makes it plain, before we were partakers of the grace of God, we were slaves to unrighteousness, we were slaves to sin. But when the grace of God appeared to us, hallelujah, Paul makes it plain further in another epistle, in Titus chapter 3, from verse 4 to verse 7, he says, But when the kindness, the grace, and the love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good, these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, they have nothing to do with them. So even in this epistle, Paul makes it very plain that the grace of God teaches us to do good works. It teaches us to do righteousness. Now, it is not good works that save us, but it is the grace of God that saves us. But once you become a partaker of the grace of God, you want to do good. You want to turn away from evil and you want to do 
what is righteous. That is your desire if you have become a partaker of the grace of God. So beloved, don't be misled by people telling you that once you receive the grace of God, you can do whatever you want to. It is not that way. The Bible makes it plain that he that does righteous is righteous as he is righteous. Let us now listen to that song again, Amazing Grace. After the song plays, we will then return to the second part of the message. God bless you. I was
God bless you, beloved, and welcome back to the program, A Study in the Word. May God richly bless each and every one of you. Please invite all your friends and neighbors, tell them to tune in on the radio ears to remember. We are currently studying the Word of God, and we are speaking about the grace of God, a topic that sometimes misunderstood, but also a very vital subject, something that we cannot live without, something we cannot do without, and that is the grace of God. We need His grace every moment, every hour. Without His grace, we can accomplish nothing. It is by His grace that He enables us to do whatever we are doing. And it is by His grace that we are what we are. And we thank the Lord for His grace. And we saw in the introductory scripture that the Bible speaks that out of the fullness of Jesus Christ, we have received grace upon grace. And the Bible makes it plain that Christ was the one that was in the bosom of the Father, and He declared the Father to us. So the Bible says nobody has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son that was in His bosom declared Him. So Christ was the manifestation and the representation of Almighty God. He was the representation and the manifestation of the grace of God. The Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace in truth came through Jesus Christ and we see that the law was good the law was the standard of righteousness telling us what is wrong and what is right but the law could not save us the law could not redeem us the law is like a policeman that can handcuff you and put you in jail but he cannot free you but we see the grace of God is what frees us frees us from sin frees us from unrighteousness and the grace of God enables us to live a righteous and holy life. As the Apostle Paul made it plain in Romans chapter 6 and also in Titus chapter 3, he makes it plain that the grace of God appeared unto us. And it is the grace of God that enables us to deny all evil, to deny all unrighteousness and to live a righteous and holy life. He speaks that once we become partakers of the grace of God, we become slaves of righteousness and not slaves of unrighteousness. Before we became partakers of the grace of God, we were slaves of unrighteousness, slaves of evils, slaves of sin and of wrongdoing. But when the grace of God appeared to us, the grace of God enables us to become slaves to righteousness and we know that a slave is somebody that has a master that has an owner and once you become a partaker of the grace of God God becomes your master God becomes your owner and you live for God it is your desire to serve him and to do his will that is what it means to be a slave of Almighty God to do good to do righteousness we see that even the Apostle John made it very plain that we should not be deceived he that does righteousness is righteous, is God is righteous. And he that does unrighteousness is unrighteous, and he is of his father, the devil. So the grace of God will never tell us to do evil, but the grace of God will always encourage and motivate us to do good. And we see that Jesus Christ came to show us what the grace of God meant by healing the sick. By casting out demons, demons and by providing salvation and forgiveness of sins to all the world. The grace of God was manifested on the cross of Calvary when Jesus Christ took the sins of the world upon himself and he died for the sins of this world. And we see that Jesus came according to Isaiah 53. The prophet predicted about the Messiah and he said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. That is the grace of God manifested on the cross of Calvary by Jesus taking our sins and the punishment of our sins upon himself. Now he was without sin. He was without blame. He was without any iniquity found in him but when he took our sins upon himself he became a sinner not because he sinned but because of our sins we see already in the garden of gethsemane jesus was was praying and his sweat was becoming like blood drops as he was drinking the cup the cup of iniquity of the sins of the world and on the cross of calvary he prayed he paid the price and the bible says that god was in christ 
reconciling the world to himself. So we see Jesus manifested the grace of God. And we see that in his ministry, his earthly ministry, Jesus manifested the grace of God. And we shall now look at a few examples of what the Bible teaches of the manifestation of the grace of God. We read in St. John chapter 8 from verse 1 to verse 11. Now this is a well-known passage. Many people are acquainted with it. The Bible speaks about this woman that was caught in the act of adultery. The Bible says, Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Another translation of the Bible says, Go now and sin no more. That is a perfect example of the grace of God. Now there's no doubt that this woman was guilty. She was caught in the act and she was a sinner. But Jesus, instead of using the opportunity to condemn her, he used the opportunity to forgive her. And that is how the grace of God was manifested. But just listen to after Jesus manifested grace to her by forgiving her, Jesus told her, go and sin no more. That is what the grace of God does. And anyone who is a partaker of the grace of God will have the same experience. God will forgive your sins and God will instruct you to sin no more. This woman was supposed to be stoned according to the law. She was supposed to be killed because of this sinful act that she committed. But still, Jesus came and he gave her grace and he gave her pardon. He gave her salvation. And after he gave her that, he instructed her to go and sin no more. And that is a very plain example of how the grace of God works. God giving us another chance God giving us his unmerited favor God giving us his gift and that is what grace is grace is a gift of God it's something that we do not deserve this woman did not deserve to be to be set free this woman deserved to die according to what the law of Moses had said but by the grace of God God forgave her and God gave her another chance not another chance to go and sin but another chance to live right we see another example of the grace of God manifested in the life of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And in Luke chapter 19, the Bible says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Then Jesus reached the spot. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Today, So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Another beautiful example of the grace of God. Now this Zacchaeus, he was an evil person. 
He was the one that was taking money from people more than he was supposed to take. He was a person that lived unrighteous. But when the grace of God appeared to him, when Jesus Christ was manifested to this man, when he came in the presence of Almighty God, he knew that he was a sinner. And because of that, because of him knowing that he was a sinner and because of Jesus appearing to him and calling him, immediately the grace of God changed his life. He did not continue doing the evil that he was doing, but he instead told the Lord that he will give back to the people that he took from unrighteously, the people that he cheated, the people whose money he took away unrighteously. And Jesus said, today salvation is come to this house. And that is another example of the grace of God. Jesus didn't tell him to continue taking people's money unrighteously. Jesus didn't tell him to continue cheating other people. But Jesus said, today salvation is come. Even Zacchaeus, being a partaker of the grace of God, did not want to continue in unrighteousness, but he wanted to instead now do righteousness. He wanted to make right his wrongs. And that is what the grace of God does. If you ever come into the presence of God and you become a partaker of his grace, you no longer want to do evil. You want to do good. It is your heart's desire to do good. We see even the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. When he came in the presence of Almighty God and he saw the seraphim appearing, he realized immediately that he was a sinful man. man. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 that he cried out and he said, Woe unto me, for I am a sinful man. I am a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the, eye, my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord of hosts. And we see that the Lord instructed one of the seraphim to take, to take a tongue, and then to take one of the coals from the altar and then to put on the prophet's mouth to purify it so that he could speak the word of God. That is another example of the grace of God. Isaiah was supposed to die because of his sins, because of his unclean mouth. But God's grace allowed him to be purified and to be cleansed. And after God purified his mouth, Isaiah went forth and he did the will of God. He went and proclaimed the, will, the word of God to the people of Israel. And that is what the grace of God will do to you and to me. You might also say that I'm a man or I'm a woman of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. I deserve to die. But when God's grace touches you, God cleanses you, God purifies you, and God sets you free. Now when God gives you his grace, God takes you as a vessel that is polluted, a vessel that is corrupted, a vessel that is filled with sin. And then God picks up that dirty vessel and then God cleans it. And after God cleans that vessel, God uses it for his purpose. And that is exactly what the grace of God does. It purifies you, it sanctifies you, it cleans you from the filth and the things of the world. Now God said to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And what we need today is more of the grace of God. Another example of the grace of God being manifested we see in the book of Luke chapter 7. We see another example of a, a woman that was caught in an unfaithful act. She wasn't actually caught on the spot but the Bible makes it plain that she had a reputation. And the Bible says that she was a prostitute. And Jesus was invited by one of the Pharisees to his house to have dinner. And while Jesus was sitting there, the, the Bible says that this sinful woman, she came and she washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and she dried it with her hair. And she also took some of a very expensive ointment and she started to anoint the feet of Jesus. And the people started to think in, in their heart, especially this Pharisee, if Jesus is a prophet, he would know who is touching him. It's a prostitute, it's a filthy person that is touching him, it's a sinner. But Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? 
I came into your house, you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, for the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Another manifestation of the grace of God right there in that chapter of Luke chapter 7. We see the sinful woman becoming a partaker of the grace of God. Crying, crying because she knew that she was guilty. Knowing that she was a sinner. But also crying because she knew that Jesus came to save her. To save her from her sins. And we see that as her life went on. She did not, the Bible doesn't say anywhere she continued being a prostitute. But she stopped with that evil when Jesus told her, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus also told her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And that is what the grace of God does. It gives us another opportunity to live right. The grace of God does not promote sin. But the grace of God reveals sin and then it also gives the opportunity to pardon sin and for people to repent of their sins. The Bible says that it is the goodness of the Lord that leads men to repentance. A last example where we can look at the grace of God being manifested is in the life of David the prophet, David the king, the well-known man in the Bible which God calls a man after my own heart. And we see that David did many great things for the Lord. And David was a man that always pleased the Lord. But we see that there was a time where evil entered into his heart. And the Bible says that he was standing in his palace. If you read 2 Samuel chapter 11. And he saw the wife of one of the, his uh, captains in his army. And she was taking a bath. And he saw her while she was washing. And then... He desired her and then he made an arrangement for her to come over. And the Bible says that he slept with the man, the man's wife. And he also arranged for the same man to go while there was a war to be put right in the f- front line so that he could be killed. So David was guilty not only of committing adultery by sleeping with this man's wife, but he was also guilty of murdering because he gave instruction for Uriah to be murdered. And we see that David, David did this evil and it was, it was not acceptable in the sight of God. But David afterwards, when God sent the prophet Nathan to him and God revealed his sin, we see that David acknowledged his sin and his transgression and he said that he has sinned against the Lord. But listen to what the prophet Nathan told him. The prophet Nathan told him that the Lord has forgiven your sin. David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Right. So we see that David did something wrong. But David also had regret in his heart because of what he had done. And because David knew that he must make right his wrongs and he went back to God, God bestowed his grace upon David. Now according to the law, David and Bathsheba was supposed to die because the law of Moses said that if something like that happens, that a man goes to a woman that is married to another man, then both of them shall be stoned. They should die. And that is what was supposed to happen to David. He was supposed to die because of his sin. Not just was he an adulterer, but he was a murderer also. But listen to the the plea of David. The Bible says in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now we see David praying to God and making a confession with a regretful heart and asking for God's forgiveness. And we see God giving him that forgiveness. God giving him that grace. And we don't read about David ever 
doing something evil like that again. And that is what the grace of God does. It pardons, it cleanses, it sanctifies, but it also motivates you to do right and not wrong. May God bless you. I hope that God has given you an understanding about His grace through this teaching on the program, a study in the Word. Let us close our eyes. Heavenly Father, thank you for those that are tuned in. Thank you, Lord, for your Word. It is a seed that has been sown. May you bless each and every one that was tuned in, Lord. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, you can contact me on 078-721-9991. 078-721-9991. If there's anyone that wants to know more about the Word of God or is in need of prayer, you are more than welcome to contact me. As I go off the air, we listen once again to Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. God bless you. Amen. I was fine. Yeah.